Book 7 is one of my favorite parts of the Overlord series. And the reason for this is that it addresses a problem most fantasy worlds should have. Powerful ex-adventurers. I mean, think about it. If just 1% of all adventurer guild members will eventually turn rogue, that usually means that hundreds if not thousands of superhuman outlaws are roaming the land without any strings attached to them. This will inevitably have an effect on society, one way or another. And Overlord neatly illustrates this ex-adventurer underground, with all of its problems and its opportunities. But why would anybody turn their back on the good adventurer guild and become a rogue? A worker that is willing to accept the most dirty of jobs if the amount of gold paid hits the right level, usually the ceiling. As explained in my previous videos, the Adventurer Guild in Overlord has a rather complex history. It was founded in the aftermath of a demonic war, had to separate itself from any state authority and declare itself strictly neutral in regards to any interhuman conflict in order to become a transnational institution that can combat threats to humanity across borders. And as a result of this, the guild tends to enforce its rather strict regulations in order to keep their neutrality and the adventurers alive. So if you violate guild rule often enough, you will eventually lose your license plate. Like literally. And by probability alone, there will always be a certain percentage of adventurers who become greedy, unruly, criminal or simply disillusioned with the adventurer guild. I mean, it's only natural that among the thousands of fireball-flinging, sword-swinging, anti-monster mercenaries, some adventurers might have a problem with any form of rules, regulation and general behavior guidelines. For example, Papa Traorgrion, the leader of Greenleaf, was kicked out of the guild for showing the guild master an offensive hand gesture, which just happened to be a fist in his face. So after physically assaulting his boss, Papa Tra was kicked out. But that little conflict doesn't necessarily mean he's a bad guy, quite the contrary. He cared for his team and was in turn held in high regards by them. And we are talking about the respect of rather dubious dudes. So he's definitively a good leader, going so far as to turn down opportunities and fortune out of safety concerns. Understanding that the worker's entire business model depends on high risk, high reward, dirty work, his attitude is rather outstanding. And as the saying goes, fear an old man in a profession where people die young. Hi. Especially if he has better equipment than most adamantite ranked adventurers. The complete opposition of an old, cautious leader who treats his teammates well would be the leader of Tenmu, Iria Usruf, a ruthless battle maniac and self obsessed slaver. Given his personality and his deep belief in the supremacy of the human race, it is widely believed that this gentleman once called the Theocracy his home. But if this is true, he had likely forsaken his birthplace and his middle name after going full on rogue. With his ego being as big as it is, it is fairly safe to assume that he didn't adhere to the God-given rules of the Theocracy or the strict guidelines of the Adventurer Guild. Taking and mistreating three elven slaves for and by himself, he is ruled by primal instincts and carnal pleasures, unable to hide his twisted nature and unwilling to restrain himself enough to function in a normal team. Aria is truly a self-centered battle maniac who is hungry for praise and power. He fights by himself and for himself, until beaten to death by a cute pet. But characterizing all workers as unruly money and power-hungry fucks, thieves and slavers isn't quite right. Especially if we consider that the Adventurer Guild had put strict rules and regulation in place to prevent adventurers from actually saving people, because power politics are sometimes far more important than human lives. And therefore some dudes will turn rogue in order to save them. For example, Robert Dyke was an elite priest who joined an infamous worker group. Not because he impregnated a priestess, stole the temple's gold or touched boys, no. He is guilty of a far more monstrous crime. He was healing the poor without paying the temple's obscene fees for this very privilege. Remember, in Overlord, the temples have a monopoly on healing magic. Their control over it is absolute. Not only are they able to dictate prices to everybody, regardless if they are even associated with the temples or not, 
but they also can prevent anyone from giving away free healing magic by hiring assassins. So no matter who you are, you just can't sell healing spells at a low cost or the gods forbid, heal the sick for free. And on the flip side, the temples don't enforce these strict rules out of malice or greed, but because a. educating healers is pretty expensive, b. they need the money for upkeep, personnel, locations and so on and so forth, c. they also use this money to maintain their own independence from state authority, usually by exerting influence at court, and d. they also use this money to arm zealots that will fight against their sworn enemy, the undead. And because the temples hold sway over this vital type of magic, the adventurer guild, who is technically in command of an elite army, has to adhere to the rules of the temples when it comes to healing magic. If not used to heal fellow adventurers, healing magic has to be extremely expensive. But even given all of this knowledge, it is still incredibly hard to adhere to these strict rules of neutrality. I mean, just ask yourself, if you are a man of the gods, if you wholeheartedly believe Healing is your true calling, it is your divine task. How many times could you walk away from a wounded man begging you to heal him, if not for his own sake, then for the sake of his wife and kids that will starve without their father working the fields? How many times are you willing to sit and watch a mother die in childbirth, knowing that you could save her and her baby with a simple hand gesture? How many times are you willing to ignore a village slowly dying of a disease you could cure, before you start to heal regardless of the consequences. Another, somewhat similar source of workers is found within a certain subset of strong people who are just unwilling to be a monster hunter mercenary. They are usually in pursuit of higher goals. For example, Brian Anglaus wanted to become the strongest swordsman in order to beat his old rival, Gazav Stronov. So he wanted to grow more powerful, but he wasn't seeking to improve his guild rank in Monster Hunter. He craved battle experience against humans. And thusly he technically became a sellsword, working for Reign of Death, a mercenary company. But people like him could also become or have been workers at some point in their lives. If their goal is just to become stronger, they likely wouldn't care too much for whom they are working, as long as they gain battle experience. By the way, Aria could also be placed in this category, since he also dreamed of surpassing Gazav and be known as the strongest warrior. So please keep in mind that his status as a worker is somewhat vague, since by the very nature there isn't any form of higher authority to enforce a strict definition. So once a secondary black market for high class ex-adventurers exists, other powerful individuals who were never even affiliated with the guild might be drawn to this occupation. In addition to all of this, there are simply a lot of those who are rich in power and short on money. Individuals who are willing to make use of the former to acquire more of the later. Arshe, one of the elite scholars of Fluder Paradine himself, left the Magic Academy in order to pay off family debts. And this is the main factor. Surely there are some battle maniacs, good guys and those who are willing to follow their higher calling. But most workers are just in it for money. So why become an adventurer if most jobs are low paying and most of the money earned is kept by the guild anyway? Why should you waste your time doing copper level quests when you are already as strong as most platinum adventurers? Why not go the morally wrong but easy way? Less work, more money and therefore higher status. For Gringham, the leader of Heavy Measure and most other workers in general, this sounds like a good offer. In fact, let's take a deeper look at Gringham to better understand his general mindset. He was born as the third son of a farmer in the Reestice Kingdom. And without any formal education, social security and money, his life looked pretty bleak. Especially because his older brothers denied him his small inheritance. But in spite of all of this, Gringham managed to beat the odds. And although he lost to Brain Anglaus in the Great Turnier back when he was still in the Reestice Kingdom, Gringham is still an impressive fighter and as a worker, he managed to earn himself a living. And with more jobs done, his strength grew, his equipment improved, and his status among his peers became so high that despite the lack of any formal education, he still managed to become the leader of an infamous worker team, 
heavy measure. Now commanding a force strong enough to take over a small town, Claire had to tow in full plate armor. Gringham has truly risen above his brothers. And he's currently just one last job away from returning home and living the good life. And like him, many workers manage to become rich. Or did I trying? And one last thing. The world of Overlord is a rather grim place. And it doesn't shy away from showing it. So what do you do with your life if you're born a half-elf? Unable to fully integrate in either human or elven society. What if you are living within the borders of a nation where other humanoids are held in contempt? Do you have any incentive to follow the law if the law itself is designed to punish you simply for existing? Is there even a normal place for a person that will by default be hated by most co-workers? Is it really morally wrong for a half-elf to break the law before it breaks them? I don't think so. And Aimina didn't either. She learned to fend for herself and eventually ended up joining Foresight, one of the Empire's more infamous worker teams. And in the next part we will take a look at the impact that the worker teams have on society and why their days might be numbered. Over and out.